Hello again and welcome back to All Access Pass. I'm your host, Jason Venner, and today we have a fabulous show featuring the one and only Mr. Frankie Avalon. Here he is. All right. Ho ho. Hello, sir. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Well, I can't follow that. I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> When I said that and they screamed, did you look for somebody else behind no, you? No, that's, that's true. But thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. We've been together a long, long time. And uh, it's nice that we get to see each other in person from time to time. So that's yeah. great. Yeah, amen, amen. You can applaud. Yeah. Now, Mr. Avalon, how many of the Malt Shop Memories cruises have you done? Uh, this is my second. Your second one. How many of you are on with Mr. Avalon on his first? Yeah. Right. Are you excited to be back with us? Absolutely. I mean, I looked forward to it because we had such fun the last time that I was here. And to do it again is just great. Uh, you know, I like uh, sailing and, and surfing and all that stuff. That's, uh, Takes you back, right? Takes you back oh, yeah. to the movie days. <laughs> See, I, I just got in, you know, and I, was, I had the TV on and I was going through the channels and I saw a, a picture uh, and I kept looking and I said, is that my son? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of your son, you have, you have eight children, is that correct? Yeah. Eight children? That's right. And I always say, nothing to it. <laughs> From your end. You know, that's really funny. It reminded me, I did, uh, I, I was, a, a little story. I was uh, at home, uh, it was a Friday night, and the phone rang, and my wife, uh, picks up the phone and she says to me, it's a Bobby De Niro for you. So, I, I mean, I, I, I know Bobby De Niro, and, uh, but she didn't relate that it was Robert, Robert De, Niro. De Niro. So I said, uh, okay, and so she hands me the phone and I start to talk to Bobby and he says to me, Frankie, you know, we're doing this picture called Casino. He said, and you were the character, Lefty, which, which Robert De Niro was mm -hmm. playing, uh, you were his first guest in Las Vegas on his television show. Mm -hmm. I said, that's right. So uh, Bobby says to me, would you come in and repeat that performance that you did uh, you know, so many years ago? I said, sure, why not? So he said, when can you do it? I said, well, um, I'm off uh, this next week. He said, how about Monday? I said, that's great. So they flew me in and I go into Scorsese's uh, little uh, place there where he's showing some films uh, uh, because he, he wanted to be so accurate. Sure. You know? And he showed the spot that I did with the real lefty. Gave you something to look back on yeah. to remember exactly. And he, he said, Frank, I want word for word. And if you have ever seen that, there is that where De Niro says to me, I understand you just like you, you have eight children. And of course I said, which I always say, there was nothing to it, you know. So I had to, that just reminded me of that. Boring story, but that just <laughs> So if you don't mind, I'd love to take us all back a little bit to a very young Frankie Avalon. Trumpet playing, kid. How did, how did, where'd you recognize the talent? How was the talent recognized? How'd you start getting into the business? Well, gee, that's a question that can last for three days. I mean, if you have to ship. <clears throat> you know, I, I, start, I started out, Jason, as a, a kid who saw a motion picture called Young Man with a Horn. For some reason, it just, just got to my heart. And I never, ever thought about music whatsoever. I wanted to be a boxer, believe it or not. And I used to box with the Police Athletic League in Philadelphia there. And I was looking to be champion of the world, you know. You know flyweight champion or something. Like <laughs> but um, I saw this picture and it just got me. And I came back. My father uh, was a very musical guy. I mean, he didn't do it. It was uh, as an amateur, never took any lessons or anything, but very talented. And he always wanted me to get into playing some instrument, whatever, sure. and I never did, until I went to him and I said, I'd like to play a trumpet. Can you get me a trumpet? And not too long after that, he went to a pawn shop and he bought me a horn. I think the, the trumpet cost him about 35 bucks, you know. And uh, he brought it home to me, and I, I just, I grabbed it, I went into my bedroom, and I closed the door, and I played uh, until I came out and played a song. So I, I, mean, I just took to it, I just loved it. And because of that, time had gone by, I, I practiced five, six hours a day. 
Um, and I, I, I studied of, of from one guy who was in my neighborhood in South Philadelphia, where I'm from. And he said, he went to my dad and he said, you know, this kid's got a lot of talent. I think, I don't, can't, I can't do any better for him now. I think you ought to try and get him some real good lessons. So my father, he went and searched and I finally went and I used to ha I'd go for a lesson once a week, it cost me five bucks a week, which my uncle would give me five bucks or whatever. And I would take a trolley car, a subway, and another trolley car to have a half hour lesson with a trumpet teacher by the name of Seymour Rosenfeld. He was the first trumpeter to the Philadelphia Orchestra. Wow. So I had great training, and I loved it. And because of that, uh, I became first trumpeter in all city. And uh, I had the opportunity to audition for Jackie Gleason. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he liked the way I played, and he put me on his show. And then they said um, they had gotten a lot of mail after that. And they said, can you do anything? Can he do, to talk to my manager at the time? Can he do anything else? So my manager said, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. What do you want him to he do? Can, he, he, he can dance. He, he can, can tap juggle. dance. Well, I never <laughs> tap dance in my life. <clears throat> but they gave me a month to learn. And there was another guy, uh, and I learned how to tap dance. And uh, they put me on the Honeymooners segment. So I had I'd done two Jackie Gleason shows. And, and, I really, and then I signed with RCA Victor recording and I played trumpet. I had a, a record that hit, as they say, the charts. So I had a, a career going as a, a trumpet player. At what point was Rocco and the Saints? The Rocco and the Saints was, um, I got the job, I auditioned for him, and uh, that was probably, and I started playing trumpet when I was about 9, 10, 11, and I was, got some success when I was about 11 years old, 12, 13. They flew me out to California. I did some television shows as a trumpet player. And I was then getting serious of, about playing the horn seriously, classically, and all that stuff. Um, and so I, I going to school, and I got this job with Rocco and the Saints. And they were, he was paying me, which was a lot of money then. He was paying me 50 bucks a week. And, and that was a lot. I was making more money what than my father at the time, you know? And I, I started as a trumpet player, and all of a sudden, uh, people started to take to, to Frankie, and uh, they would say, but can you sing? Yeah, well, I want you to sing a song. And, and Rocco would say to me, you gotta sing a song. I said, Rocco, I'm a trumpet player. I'm not a singer. He said, I'll give you an extra five bucks. I said, I'll I'm do a singer. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got uh, into the singing, by, by being a trumpet player. And you know, my career, it's amazing, you know. From going to that to something, then all of a sudden I'm a movie star. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, no, no, no. I, I say because of the fact, you know, I never acted before or anything like that, but the now Frankie Avalon becomes an entity to where I've got a following and a lot of you guys were out there and buying my records and stuff. And so now Warner Brothers says, hey, we got to get this kid. Uh, in one of these pictures with a major star so he could bring in the young audience. And I don't know if you all remember it, but my first film was at Warner Brothers with Alan Ladd, who was the star, and the picture was called Guns of the Timberland. And I'm a South Philadelphia kid on a buckboard riding with horses. <laughs> um, so I did that. There it is, Frankie, right there. Is that, there you go. That's the first album, or second album, or whatever it is. That's yeah, you riding the horse right up there and on the horse. I got to sign that for you, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And then it goes to eBay, which is not <laughs> So you, you hit the movies about, about what, 1962? No, 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 no. That, 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 that's, was that just the Annette? No, no, yeah, yeah, no. 58 is when I did Guns of the Timberland. Because of that picture, uh, John Wayne, my agent, uh, went to John Wayne and they were doing the Alamo, and the character was Smitty, uh, and a young uh, character, and my manager showed, agent showed him the film that I just finished, because it was just coming out, and he said, okay, I want to sign him to a movie uh, called The Alamo. So I went and did The Alamo for six months uh, in Brackettville, Texas. And they said, what do you remember about that? I said, snakes. <laughs> I never saw a snake in my life in the Alamo. I know we're about to get into some very intriguing movie moments, which everyone is curious about. So before we get into that, though, we're going to take a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back with Mr. Frankie. Adler.
Yeah. Welcome back. Here we are on All Access Pass with the one and only Mr. Frankie Avalon. Yeah. So you start making moves, and uh, soon they want to turn you into a pretty boy surfer. I know. I know. You go from horseback to surfboard. I know. Amazing. You know, uh, surfing. I mean, I, I don't even drown good. <laughs> well, you know, uh, yeah, the, the funny thing is with those films is that, you know, uh, the relationship of Frankie and Annette was really the most important thing about those films. Everybody wants to know about and, the you know, years, of course. You know, all the real surfers and all that stuff, you know, the, they knew I wasn't a surfer. They didn't care. You know, it was that nice. story. It was, it was Frankie and Annette and, and, and Young Love, and it was just wonderful. Tell us a little bit about the Annette years in those movies. Uh, well, What's it like working with her? You well, you know, um, I had met Annette the first time. Uh, it was 1958, so I was just getting, you know, getting the heat on. And, uh, and she was very popular because of the fact she was on the... Mickey Mouse Club and had a great following. So um, Dick Clark, our old friend, Dick Clark, uh, had a show at the uh, Hollywood Palladium. Mm -hmm. Not the Palladium, Hollywood Bowl. Bowl. Hollywood Bowl. And uh, he had a big lineup of, uh, of, of people there. And Annette was one of them, and I was one of them, and I got to meet her. And let's see, I was 18, she was about 16 when I met her. And. Um, I, I said, could I have your phone number? And she said, you've got to ask my mother. <laughs> so I did, and uh, I called her and uh, set up a time to go and take her on a date, and I took her to have some pizza. We had pizza. Yes, you do. And after that, you know, uh, you know, I went my way, she went her way, and then things had to happen. And so, I mean, I dated her, and, and we liked each other a lot. And finally, when I, I had signed a contract with a, a company called American International Pictures, and I made a few pictures, uh, uh, some war pictures and all of the other stuff, and one of the writers I got very friendly with, uh, Lou Russoff was his name, and I said to him, he used to come to my house and I'd cook for him and all this other stuff, I said, I said Lou, why don't you try to write something, you know, about young people and, and, and fun and, and exciting. I, I used to love the, the, the Bowery Boys pictures and that kind of camaraderie of friendships and the, he said, all right, I'll think about it. About a month later, he came back and he gave me a script. He said, read this. And I read it. It was called Beach Party. Uh -huh. I said, Jesus, it really is. I think you hit the, the note there. I, I really like it. I said, now, who are you going to get to play uh, the lead, the female lead? He said, Annette Funicello. I said, great. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> of course, then, uh, a few years later, Greece. Oh, Greece, oh yeah, wow. There's a story there too. You know, I, I was playing the Copacabana in New York City and uh, they had called me, the people who were producing uh, the play on Broadway of Greece, and they said, we'd like you to come in and do some promo because you know, you were a guy 20 years ago, this was 1972 or three, that you know, was this kind of a genre era and would you do some publicity with us? I said, sure. So I go there and I watch the play. And time goes by, I meet Travolta at the time, and because they were all in the play then. Mm -hmm. uh, Bosworth, the, the, he was the lead. And, and um, went my way, and, and time had gone by, and uh, I was playing golf, and I had a manager, uh, Dick Link, who managed Andy Griffith, and uh, he was, I come off the ninth hole, and he's there, and he's got a script, he says, Here's, Paramount wants you to do this picture. So I said, uh, what's the picture? He said, it's called Grease. I said, oh yeah, I, I know the play. He said, uh, I said, well, what character? He said, Teen Angel. I said, um, pass. I'm not interested. So I go, I play the backside, back nine, I come back in again, he's there with the script. He said, they will not take no. They would at, at least like for you to come to Paramount and meet with them and talk with them. I said, okay, so we go in, and I talk to them, and Alan Carr, who was the producer, and Randall Kleiser, the director, Patty Birch, and we talk about, you know, the, the film Grease, and they said to me, why don't you want to do this? I said, the reason is because I had seen the play, and I know the character uh, of Teen Angel, I said, and I'm not that character. I said, that character is all in black, leather, long sideburns, and he doo-wops. I'm, 
I don't have that style. I have a different kind of a style. I don't sing that way. And uh, they said, we'll change it. <laughs> I said, well, how will you change it? We'll put you all in white. <laughs> and we'll get, uh, you, where's your, who's your conductor, your pianist? Okay, let's work with it. And we started to work the way I did. Your story sad to tell. You know, a different kind of rendition. And uh, that's how it, it, it worked out. Wow. And there it is. Yeah. But the funny thing is, now I go to film it, right? So um, for the rehearsals were six days on a sound stage. You know, that's where they got tape and you, you know, a flat floor like this and you do, uh, and you walk to the next one and you do this move here and you do this one and that one. You know. And then after six days of the rehearsal comes shoot time. So that means now you go right on the set. And I look at the set, it's beautiful, it's all white. And my position, first position, is 30 feet in the air. Now, I don't like heights. <laughs> believe me. And it wasn't, you know, until I got up there, so uh, exactly like this, standing on a little st uh, pedestal like this, I had to stand there. So what they did, they gave me a little, uh, uh, like a, a pipe to hold on to Sounds while sad. I was rehearsing, and I'd walk down the steps, you know, and all that. Now, the more I did it, the more I, I got frightened of this. I said, you know what, I get to the third step and I said, I can't do this. She said, what do you mean? I said, I, said, I can't, my, my legs, I'm shaking. I'm supposed to be this cool guy with the thing. I said, I, I just can't do this. So they got into a meeting and what they did is they, they figured out how to put on each side of this set white mattresses. <laughs> So I got the feeling that I can't fall, I'm going to be in bed, you know. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's the way it worked out. We did 14-hour days to shoot that five-minute song, that scene. Two 14-hour days. Now, the director comes to me and he says, uh, Frankie, do you remember me at all? I said, uh, she's Randall, I, I really don't. He says, I was an extra in all your beach party pictures. <laughs> Full circle. This is the director. Full circle. Yeah. You gotta love that. You never know, huh? <clears throat> All right. Do not go anywhere because we have some great <laughs> stuff coming up in just a minute with more Mr. Frankie Avalon. <laughs> Welcome back, and here we are with a few more stories with the wonderful Mr. Frankie Avalon. <laughs> So you, you do all the movies, you're, you're making it big time, but it isn't it until 2009 where you finally become a household name when you finally perform on American Idol. How did it feel to finally make it after all those years? Well, you know, it's really something. Um, I, you know, I was a fan of the show, and I, I, I didn't know the people that were the judges or any of those things. And I had gotten the call to do it, and I said, gee, it'd be kind of nice to do it. It'd be great. You know, what song you want to do? Of course, what else? Venus. Venus. I said, terrific. Okay. Now, they said, the thing is this. You've got to be a surprise because they, the judges don't know that you're going to come out. Oh, that's the They didn't know that. So they hid me in one of these dressing rooms, you know. And... Um, I'm back in the dressing room and I'm you know, just, I, I did the rehearsals and they weren't there because they arrive about uh, maybe a half hour, hour before yep. shooting. You know. um, so as I'm back there, I, you know, as an as a idiot, you know, I didn't eat a lot of food the day before, even that day, because you want to look good to go on screen. <laughs> You know, everybody the camera says, adds you know, 10, that, that, so, yeah. the, that camera puts on 10 At pounds. Least, yeah. which is, you know, so I, I didn't have anything in my stomach, this, that, whatever. And, and believe me, they had, in my dressing room, they had a, uh, uh, a basket of all these different goodies and all this stuff. There. And I got a hold of these red something, red <laughs> candies, red hot stuff. Well, I ate the whole box of candies. <laughs> now... I'm th th getting ready. I've got about, oh, seven, eight minutes to get to backstage to make my entrance to this thing, show. So I, I, I'll never forget, I put my jacket on like this. All of a sudden, I start to shake. I said, it was a sugar, Bit of a sugar rush, which I never experienced in my life. <laughs> now, 
and I'm going, geez, I don't feel it. I'm on in five, six minutes to a show that's got 30 million people. <laughs> you know. Now they're, they're concerned. They get a doctor. In the holding room, before I'm ready to make the entrance there, they take my blood pressure and everything. I was like 200. I, I, I mean, through the roof, right? So they said, maybe you should. I said, listen, I don't, I'm doing this show. I don't care what. I'll get out there and I'll handle it. And that's, uh, you know, and I got out there and I wasn't 100% to me, you know, sure. and, and pulled it off. But boy, that was really quite a <laughs> frightening experience. Yeah. Now, as our studio audience knows, we like to ask, uh, we like to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions of you. So I have a couple of questions here, and I know that uh, some of the folks here are willing to stay a little bit beyond six. So I'll ask a couple. We'll then uh, we'll then break and maybe come back for a couple okay. more if everyone's okay. If you're okay with that, sir. <laughs> so Scott, all the way from uh, from uh, Harrisburg, PA, Scott wants to know, uh, very politically correct, what is the most embarrassing moment you've had on stage? Um, Everyone's got you know, that, that's I remember one really embarrassing moment. It was, uh, I, I like to go in the audience. You'll see my performance if you come to the show. I like to go out. If, in the if you come to the show. <laughs> and I, I like if you're not doing out, anything, then. And I like to sing, and, and you know, because on the stage, you know, and you know, when, when you go onto these different stages, you know, if you don't have time to see exactly what it is. But long story short, I, I, I was saying I wanted to go down the audience and didn't know that there was another step, and I went bang. And I said to the audience, if you think I'm getting up, you're nuts. <laughs> that was embarrassing. <laughs> and every woman on the bottom row ran to help you up. I'm sure you're struggling. Uh, do you have any special memories from your first mall shop cruise? Um, gee, my memory is that I was sick. Oh. Was it the second one? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, that's the one I remember then. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember I had that gotten one. an awful cold or whatever it was, but I, again, you know, the show must go on. And you uh, go out and you do the best that you can. Susan wants to know, what is the cruising experience like for you? What is the cruising experience like on the malt shop cruises? What's it like for you? Well, I think it, it, it's great because it gives me a chance to say hello to a lot of people. I got a lot of friends here that I see you know, around the country. And it, it's great. You know, I, I happen to be a, a people person, so I mean, I like people, and I think that's very important. You know, uh, there are a lot of guys in my business that uh, they're fine on that stage, but they just don't want to mix and mingle. You know, but th there are guys like that. Uh, but I'm not one of them. I, I like them. And the last question before we go to this break, out of all the celebrities you've met and worked with over all the years, who has impressed you the most? Probably, I would say Jose Ferrer. Interesting. He was a brilliant man. And I got to meet him, and we became friendly. And I played golf at this club called Lakeside, which a lot of celebrities belong there. It's near the studios and everything. And I got him to come over and play golf, and I would just listen to him. He was brilliant. He'd talk about music, he'd talk about opera, he'd talk about classical, he'd talk about jazz, he'd talk about authors, he'd talk about paintings. I mean, he was just a brilliant man. And I, I mean, I, he's the most admired man I've ever, I mean, I've been with John Wayne and Sinatra and all these guys. This guy to me was the top. Yeah. That's fantastic. I think because you can say names like Sinatra and John Wayne and whatnot, and, and with all due respect to Mr. Herrera, that's kind of a surprising answer, I guess you'd say, to people that even think they know you awfully well. The, 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 the man who had the most, I mean, charisma of them all, I mean, I've been with Sinatra, I mean, I've worked with Sinatra, he'd call me, uh, be on the plane, we're going to do this show, we're doing this, and uh, help me with this charity here and all that stuff, and you know, I'd be with him at restaurants, uh, but to, I, when I did the promotion for the Alamo with John Wayne, and if you, I would walk into a restaurant or airport or whatever, and when he would walk by or into a restaurant, I mean, you have never seen a, a reaction of people to s look at John Wayne. Yeah. It was just, <laughs> 
you know. The other guys, hi, uh, Frank, uh, Mr. Sinatra, or John Wayne would, I mean, he was huge, believe me. He was about 6'5", I mean, big. And he had that walk, you know, that kind of walk like this. And he was very shy, shy, yeah, very shy guy. And he would sit down and people would just stare at him. Not say anything. He was the most impressive I've ever been with. That's a fantastic story. All right, we're going to take one more break, then we'll come back with a couple more questions with the fabulous. <laughs> Welcome back. Here we are with a bonus segment on All Access Pass. <laughs> 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 uh, we left off there talking about John Wayne and how impressive he was. Uh, I, I think a lot of people in this room, and in fact, I was commenting to you a little bit backstage, and when my wife handed these to me, there's a lot of questions about Annette in okay. here. Uh, would you elaborate a little bit on, on, on your time working in the movies together and what it was like working with, with Miss Pinnichelle? Well, yeah, well, our friendship really, really became a true friendship of families because of the fact that I am godfather to her firstborn, oh, wow. Gina. So we spent a lot of time, my wife, my kids, her kids, her husband, Jack Gillardi was her first marriage. And he was my agent, still my agent to this day. He's put me in every motion picture. I just finished the picture, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And he made the last deal for me. I said, I'm not doing any more pictures. But he said, no, you got to do this one, which I'm glad I did. But um, family, she, she was the sweetest, uh, nicest, uh, greatest gal to work with, uh, number one. We never had a disagreement, never had an argument. Uh, we knew our lines. Uh, she would break up uh, for some reason, I don't know what it was, but I tickled her funny bone and she ruined more takes by just <laughs> laughing. I said, no, please don't do that. We got to get through this. You're busting up. Yeah. But um, uh, you know what was really amazing? Uh, when she was having uh, the three children and raising them, great mom, um, I would come back off of a singing tour, doing another film or television, whatever it was. And, we get together again, and I'd say to her, Annette, I gotta tell you this. People love you. They adore you. And she'd say, really? <laughs> she never really got to get the adulation uh -huh. that people just loved her, because she was, she was a mom, you know? Um, she'd get very nervous in, in performing sure. live, you know? Sure. Like we did one Super Bowl. Um, I forget which one it was. But you know, you got 75,000 people yeah. in the stands and 200 million, 500 million people watching you, you know. And she was nervous. I would calm her down and say, come on, we're going to have fun. It's just fun. You know, it's just fun. Don't worry about any of this stuff. You know, I'd relax her. And uh, she'd pull it, pull it off. She, she was a trooper. She was great. Yeah. I think it's, it's absolutely undeniable when you watch the movies. The chemistry is amazing. I, you mean, chemistry is, is palpable. And we you knew it the first, first take. You can sense it. The first take of Beach Party. Um, as we're singing in the, in the, in the car, Beach Party tonight, and we come down this little road and we get out and, and I go to make a pass at her like this and she moves away and I go around and finally I, I get to this little bunk cabin that we had, you know, and I say, well, this is it. You know, I've waited for this a long time in mind what I've got in my mind. <laughs> and she says, oh yeah, I say, wait a minute. We're ready to go in. I say, no, let's do this right. And I grabbed her and picked her up in my arms like this, and I kicked the door open like that. And I walked in, and there were the guys here, the girls all over the place. I said, you said we were going to be alone. And we, we did that first take, and I felt it. I said, gee, this is going to be a lot of fun. Because it just clicked. You know, it's, it's like we've known each other all these years anyway. Sure. You know, and it just worked. So it was a, a great relationship. I love that. That's a great story. Mm -hmm. Here's a very direct question from Sharon. Sharon wants to know, was your song, A Boy Without a Girl, meant for a special person? No. <laughs> Next question. A girl is a song without a tune, is a year without a June, my love. No, just yeah, a, there it is, yeah. a nice little song. Uh, this, an interesting question like this came up the other day, and I think these are kind of fascinating. Uh, what's your, out of all the songs you recorded, and we know the big ones. And the, uh, what is your least favorite song you've recorded? All right. <laughs> That's better than saying what's the best song you recorded. Yeah, exactly. I did a song written by two of the hottest rock and roll songwriters, 
but Doc Schumann and Thomas, they, they wrote Presley songs and this, that, whatever. And they br brought me the song, and I said, I don't like this song. And they said, no, but this, this is a hot team. This is a great song. <laughs> All right, I'll do it. And I did it, and to me, it's the worst record I've ever made. And it's called Two Fools. That reaction tells us that you're not the only one. <laughs> Apparently, you're not the only one who thought it sucked. So. I, I just didn't like that song at all. And when I hear it, I you know, but wish it, I'd never recorded it, but it's there. But it's there, yeah. Well, don't worry. Not many people have heard it. Right. Uh, <laughs> the next question shifts gears entirely to something much more current. Tell us a little bit about the cookbook. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm... Uh, I'm uh, Glad you said cookbook. I'm not a chef, I'm a cook. And I've been cooking for my family and my grandkids. I've got 10 grandkids and friends and all this stuff. 10 grandkids. <laughs> Before you go on, go ahead, go ahead. What do the grandkids call you? They call me grandpa. They call you grandpa. Every, well, I feel like there's probably, like for instance, I asked, uh, asked little Anthony and they call him Poppy. Like every, no, I feel like a lot of grandpa, grandparents grandpa, have different. Grandpa, grandpa, grandpa. Grandpa, okay. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so I, I, you know, I cook for them and, and I try to keep the tradition of my heritage. I'm of Italian descent, and I, I, I try to keep this uh, tradition on Sundays, you know, how families get together, sure. and I make the macaroni, and the meatballs, and the things, and the brajoles, and, and, and but then I've had friends over, and uh, we'd have wonderful times, and drink our wine, and do all that, and, and finally everybody say, you know, Grandpa, or Frankie, you know, you ought to write a cookbook. You ought to do so finally I was with a friend of mine in Nantucket, uh, about a year and a half ago, I guess, some, about a year ago. And uh, we were talking about food, and my friend uh, had a friend who was an agent, literary agent, and he said, Frankie, why don't you do a cookbook? I said, well, I thought maybe, well, long story short, made a deal, signed with uh, St. Martin's uh, Publishers, and uh, we got a cookbook, and it's, it's a damn good one, very good. And it's on board. It is? It is, it's on board. It's up in the shops, so uh, for everyone really? watching, everyone them on board? yeah, we got them on board. We got them on board, and uh, there's a lot of great stuff in it. So for those of you watching, yeah. those of you here in the audience, go check it out. It's in the. Uh, I'm going to uh, do a segment here uh, yeah. of, of cooking, right? Yep, we have a cooking when is show. That, we have a cooking show coming up in just a couple of days when we get back out yeah. onto the ocean. So uh, and I'm going to make my favorite and the simplest kind of a this was actually ingredients that, that that will. And, you, and the audience is going to taste it, too. Yep. It's, it's a crab sauce. Oh. A marinari crab sauce. And I want to tell you, and, and the taste of that, you like pasta, you like sauces. This is, to me, my favorite. You can't argue with that. And I think that's the perfect way to send us off to enjoy another fabulous yeah. evening here on board. To everyone out there, to everyone watching, thanks so much for tuning in. Give it up. By the way. For the Frank Gamble. And Bobby oh. Rydell, my friend, is on the, on, on the cruise here, too. Make sure you see Bobby. I love Bobby. He's the best. He's the most talented. Make sure you go see Bobby. And that's it for Frank Gamble. Thanks for tuning in, folks. See you around.